This is Hook Theory, Episode 2, A Tale of Two Riffs. So let's talk toxicity. No, not that one. It's very fun and easy to tear things apart, especially when those things are so obviously horrible. And there are way too many people who have made a living out of doing exactly that. It's also fun to talk about things you love and to build them up. And most times the vibe of positivity that you emit seems to be the trump card that, that people use to validate all of their points because you're building something up. So everything you say in favor of the positivity has to be true. And don't get me wrong, I love the fact that there are channels emerging right now who care more about finding the positive in things that they love rather than just blatant endless criticism. I admit I was part of the crew that was into Channel Awesome back in the late 2000s, and I will be spending my days never able to live that down. But you can be positively toxic as well as negatively. Which brings me to the popular YouTuber Rick Beato, who I watched for a while, and I know there are people out there who really take umbrage with him and, and really don't care for what he has to say. And I, th I think he's the real deal, I do. I think that, um, he knows his stuff, he knows what he's talking about, and I, I think he ultimately uses this superpower of ours for good. But I gave up on him after a while because his videos started to get a little name droppy and Dick Cavett-esque. Let's walk and talk. I, uh, I have some wonderful stories about other famous people that include me in some way. Jeez, that reference isn't going to date me at all. Another reason is that he holds up the 90s as some kind of golden era of unique and innovative songwriting. And in one video in particular, I can't remember which one because, you know, I have a day job and a mortgage, so I can't search through his hundreds of videos. He made a statement while showing a, I think it was a Soundgarden or a Nirvana riff that has sort of stuck with me and the statement sort of haunted my thoughts every now and then. It's not a direct quote, but here's me paraphrasing. And the quote is, they don't have to know what they're doing. I know what they're doing. If they know to do it instinctively, they don't have to know what it is. Now the problem with this notion is that theory runs both ways. You can write music from an established set of parameters. Your styles, your genre, your instrumentation, your registers, whatever. Writing from a place where the rules come first. But you can also extract a set of rules from anything, provided you broaden your spectrum enough of what you consider to be competency, and more importantly, intention. So in the spirit of fairness and not making a video that's specifically positive or negatively toxic toward Rick and his beliefs, let's examine two riffs of the 90s that were almost contemporaries, certainly bred from the same stylistic culture. One, musically, where I'll examine the structure and the phrasing of them. Two, the utilization of a classic songwriting tool. And three, show how one riff affirms that tool and another subverts it completely. And the other dimension is me asking you to keep in mind as I go over this that one of these riffs is one of the most beloved, overplayed, and revered riffs the world over. And another comes from a man who struggled and suffered his entire musical career to even prove that he and his band even existed. So let's dive in. So riff number one is one that you all know. I'm sure every guitar player learned this in their first year, and even people who don't know anything about rock or guitar or anything like that have heard this riff in a Walgreens, in a Home Depot, in a Bennigan's, if those still exist, anywhere. And yes, for the sake of argument, I know this is an F. I'm transposing it down to E for consistency. So what I'll first point out about that riff is that it's a very classic call and response, or question and response, if you want to think of it that way. So you can hear the way that that riff doesn't really do much more than a simple call and response, and it only involves the four chords that are essentially the one, the three, the four, and the six of an E minor scale. So now let's look at our second riff. So 
So as you hear, it starts with that same sort of call and response. <laughs> Ending is how I've transposed them together, it uses the first same two chords as Teen Spirit. But Tim Smith throws in a little more Hendrix-esque ornamentation. Pretty standard stuff. The next part is where it actually gets interesting, because as you'll note, the very last note of that A riff involves a G natural, not a G sharp, as has been established in the fact that this is an E. And the reason he chooses to end it on this note is because it's the fifth of the next chord that signals a change. That's where you get to your C, your flat six. And again, that C is also present as the fourth chord of Teen Spirit. So again, the elements are there and similar to what is used by Kurt Cobain. But Tim Smith, he's throwing it off a little bit with ornamentation and by approaching it from a slightly different angle. And that C he's played is just a signal of the fact that everything's a little different. He returns to the home of E to reestablish things. And with that E established, he proceeds to throw you off with an asymmetrical rhythm, different to what you were hearing through everything up to this point. Each one of those chords starts on the end of the beat, as opposed to right on the downbeat. So let's hear those riffs one more time, and take a listen and make sure you hear how they're similar and where they diverge. So what's the takeaway from all of this? Well, I think it's important that you get these notes and shapes under your fingers as soon as you can and really start to internalize them so that you understand what's happening. Because once you understand how the phrasing and the playing happens, you begin to develop a bit of an ear and an intuition behind something that sounds intentional and something that sounds like they got that sound just because they lay their fingers in a certain way. So do you think Rick has a point? Am I just full of it? I'll let you decide. Leave me a comment, like and subscribe, and let me know if you agree with Rick or if maybe I have a point. So this has been Hook Theory. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.